Yeah, um, thank you for the opportunity to, um, to speak here. Um, I'll talk about epilepsy and seizures today. And I thought I'd give you a quick introduction into what epilepsies and seizures are. The um, epilepsy is essentially actually a family of diseases, so there are actually um, different sub-diseases to it, where patients display unprovoked seizures. And seizures, in this case, are essentially episodes of abnormal brain activity that interrupt the normal brain function. And when I say episodes, it means usually on the time scale of seconds to minutes. And uh, epilepsy actually affects about um, 65 million people worldwide. And it's a huge economic burden. I could only find the number for the UK, but um, I think it's actually worldwide uh, a huge problem in the developed as well as um, less developed world. And seizure control, um, that's a number that you usually see, um, is not effective in 30% of patients. And even in the 70% of patients where it does work, the medication side effects often um, are a big problem or a big challenge to patients. And so the improvement of um, patient treatment and their care it really is needed to improve their quality of life. And I'll just want, I just want to highlight um, or show you how a seizure looks like so that you get a bit of a better feel what I'm talking about when I say it's actually a um, disturbing disease that really wants our attention from research. So this is a patient that's, um, I think, 16 or 17 years old in this, in this video. And he's just coloring his uh, book in at the minute. Um, but in a second, you'll see him freeze about now. And then the seizure starts in a second. And you see this head move, so it, this involuntary head movement, including then the arm, arm movement and the sounds, and then the convulsions. Etc. Um, I'll. I think I'll not let this run the whole. Basically, this lasts for about a minute until the patient then stops and uh, um, essentially is in a dazed state. And um, so that's how a seizure could look like. Um, different seizures can look slightly differently. Uh, it's just an illustri illustrative um, video. And how clinicians then diagnose seizures is usually by using EEG. So um, I, th I don't think I need to explain to this audience what an EEG is. Uh, basically, we measure the potentials uh, from the brain. And I've, I've got here, uh, I'll just use the mouse actually. Um, I've got here a trace um, of, a, uh, of a seizure actually uh, in a patient. And in this particular example, it's from this electrode that you see some abnormal EEG activity, and abnormal in this case refers to these spike and wave kind of um, activities. And then an uh, experienced clinician will tell you, okay, that's probably um, s suspected seizure activity. Okay, so the, from a research perspective, then that gets right into the, um, the topic that I want to talk about today, is how when you look at the EEG or in the, in the intracranial case, the ECOG, how do you decide what is a seizure? How do they look like? How do they start? just morphologically from just the observation of the um, electrographic signature. And you can actually, um, or in the past people have actually tried to categorize um, how this morphology looks. And the, uh, the consensus, I would say, although there's not, it's a bit of a battle in the field, but the consensus is essentially that um, over 50% of seizures start like this um, in the way that I've highlighted it. So the, you would call this uh, segment a normal um, background activity. And then here you see some higher, um, slightly higher, so it's higher frequency oscillations that are fairly low in their amplitude, building up some sort of um, abnormal activity until it gets released into a higher amplitude oscillations, which uh, you would definitely call epileptic spikes or epileptic spike waves in this case. So this seizure in, starts with a low amplitude, um, fast oscillation. So that's what most people call these types of seizures. Um, but there are other types of onsets that you can observe. And I've uh, broadly categorized them into um, what I call high amplitude, slower oscillations. So essentially, the amplitude of on onset um, is a lot higher than what we observe here. And the um, oscillatory nature, so the frequency of it, is slower. So this usually is um, above alpha, so, uh, it's, so where people set the cutoff is, is dependent on the clinician, but um, usually people say over 10, 15 hertz is what you would call this low amplitude uh, fast activity. And then this is usually in the range of um, below 8 hertz um, sort of activity. 
And that happens in 25% uh, of focal seizures. So just to quickly summarize um, these different patterns, so the different patterns can be identified and can be categorized. And most commonly what we see is this low amplitude fast activity. And the second most common is this higher amplitude um, activity of lower frequency. And just from a scientific perspective, of, can, of course, you can ask how can these different patterns be um, explained because there are clearly categories and why do we see in some patients one pattern and in some patients the other pattern. Uh, and we took essentially a um, computational modeling approach to uh, try and explain this phenomenon. Uh, the model that I'm going to talk about is uh, actually a previously published model and uh, it's actually also available on ModelDB if anybody wants to look it up when I get my mouse. Uh, the model ID um, number is there. And the model is essentially using the idea that um, the computational unit of the cortex is a, a, a cortical column. And uh, we basically take a lot of these cortical columns and concatenate them to form a cortical sheet. And so this is illustrated here. We have a column here, and then we concatenate them to form a cortical sheet. Um, each column in this case is modeled uh, very simplistically by a Wilson-Cowan unit. And this was, in this case, um, actually... Uh, sufficient to capture the dynamics that we wanted to capture. Um, you, it, this, this model obviously also needs uh, connectivity, so we've been talking about that a lot. And this connectivity was, um, or we basically drew from the existing literature in terms of what this mesoscopic uh, connectivity is. I may just draw your attention also to the um, scale of this. So we assume essentially each uh, column to be of uh, 50 micrometers and we concatenate them to form about um, the cortical sheet of 7.5 millimeters by 7.5 millimeters. So this is really talking about mesoscopic connectivity. And what we know about it, or what most people um, would agree with, is that there are uh, feedforward um, projections from excitatory to excitatory populations, um, which is like in a, in a distance-dependent manner. So that's uh, what this is showing. So this um, is illustrating uh, the connection from one column, so in, colored in red, to, uh, and its projection, its target columns colored in black. So the red is projecting to the black dots in this, in this case, um, in the feed-forward excitation projection. Um, equally, there are also feed-forward inhibition projections, so excitatory populations projecting to inhibitory populations, and it's thought to be that the projections are actually um, in, working in a similar manner. But additionally, there is, a, um, or there is evidence for another type of um, mesoscopic connectivity, which is this um, patchy remote connectivity. Um, it's been termed in the literature, which is essentially that um, this red dot can actually also project to slightly further away um, columns, but um, they usually form patches like this. And so the, all these types of connectivity are included in this model, and we're basically trying to m model this uh, cortical patches in terms of its connectivity as realistically as possible. And the types of outputs you get from this model, um, I'll just show you some examples. Um, this, so this is a normal background, well, normal background. It's background activity, um, so there's not um, much activity going on. You can just see some background fluctuations, so it's because that's um, driven by noise, the system. But you can actually also find a more coherent oscillatory state uh, in the model, which uh, we set um, or which we equal to the seizure state uh, due to various properties, mainly the oscillatory uh, component of it. Um, and be because in the model we can actually find these two, this, this background activity and the seizure activity, um, we then analyze the model in terms of um, different parameters and drew conclusions. Um, but I'll, that, so that's in the previous paper. But in this paper, we actually want to focus on how the, uh, how the seizure started. Uh, how the seizure patterns actually start. And the way we've uh, done it is basically by taking this idea that seizures actually start from tiny little areas, so-called micro-seizure uh, clusters. So these are um, shown in black here. Essentially, I have these um, little clusters of uh, mini columns that actually behave slightly abnormally in that they show seizure activity, um, or they can spontaneously show seizure activity. And we have a couple of them, and they can show seizure activity independently. Um, but they're embedded in this healthy surrounding tissue, meaning this tissue normally, if you, know, if you don't provoke it, it won't, show, it won't behave abnormally. So that's the model. And using this model, of course, uh, you can already imagine there's a lot of parameters to uh, 
to um, adjust or to play with and uh, to actually get a seizure. And I'll just show you an example seizure that um, you can get out of this model. Um, so above, you uh, will recognize this clinical recording again of the low amplitude um, fast activity um, that, we, that I showed at the beginning. And you can actually find a similar activity in the model as well. So this trace, this simulated ECOG recording, um, of essentially taking the average of this um, cortical patch that I've been simulating and essentially pretended that there is an electrode above that patch, and then that's the recording that I obtain. And you actually find fairly similar activity in the model as well um, in terms of the onset pattern. You can see that at the beginning that you have some fairly low amplitude fast activity, which evolves then into these higher amplitude, um, uh, more coherent oscillatory activities. Um, you can then, of course, uh, because we have the information, look at what is actually happening spatial temporally. So what is happening um, in these different areas um, on this patch. And you'll see, so this red line marks where this t equals zero is. And you'll see that over time, essentially slowly, um, some of these microdomains become active, um, show seizure activity. And that, that is essentially this phase where you see this low amplitude fast oscillations. And then they uh, kind of, they form little pockets which then coalesce um, in terms of seizure activity to then recruit the entire cortical sheet into a, um, well, into a, into a seizure, which is then this period here, essentially. Okay, so um, that's good. We can essentially find some, some correspondence in the model of, of the onset pattern that we're after. Uh, can we find the other high amplitude onset pattern as well? And yes, the answer is um, we can. And um, basically, um, it, looks, it can look something like this. And if you look at the um, spatial temporal uh, evolution of this seizure. Again, you'll see that it's actually very different. So again, um, the red line marks uh, t equals zero. And you'll see that the evolution or the full recruitment of the sheet happens a lot faster. And within 0.4, or within the first um, 400 milliseconds, essentially, the seizure has already spread to about uh, a quarter of this cortical sheet, which is why we see this high amplitude onset, essentially. So in the model, essentially, we can find different um, types of onset patterns as well. And then we were interested in, okay, so what are the model parameters actually determining these um, different onset um, patterns? And um, I've performed a, uh, this is a parameter scan, essentially. Um, I'll walk you through the different axes um, slowly. So the, the first axis I wanna highlight is this number of subclusters. Well, that is essentially, if you remember, we essentially had these micro seizure domains that were scattered in this healthy, or embedded in this healthy tissue. And the number of subclusters essentially refers to how many of, uh, so, you know, how many of them are scattered in the sheet, whether it's one big one or several, or if they are divided into several different subclusters. And the per percentage of uh, mini columns with micro seizure activity is essentially the percentage of the black versus the white. So how much healthy tissue do we have, how much, uh, abnormal tissue do we have? Um, so these are the two parameters that we're scanning. And this third parameter that I'm scanning is essentially the excitability level of the surround. So this, um, this healthy tissue here that I've said, how excitable is this? And you'll see in a bit what I mean by that. Essentially, it regulates, or this parameter um, in the wilson cowan essentially regulates the background lev uh, input level or the ex well, yeah, excitability level um, of the wilson cowan oscillator. Okay, so with these um, three parameters, uh, we can you know, have a look at the parameter space scan and you can visually already, uh, I should tell you what actually the dots are. So the dots are the dot size, so the bigger the dot, the higher the amplitude of the seizure onset. And the darker the color, the higher the amplitude of the seizure onset as well. So visually you can already see that the uh, high amplitude onset seizures seem to be located in an area of parameter space that's on the high end of the surround excitability. Um, actually, we can um, show this a little bit better even. Bas basically, what I've done then is to collapse all those data points that you've seen previously just on this one parameter, um, this surround excitability. And you can see that the seizure amplitude essentially drops um, uh, with this parameter quite clearly. And you can actually look at the onset frequency as well, and you'll see that there is a distinct jump here um, between the higher... Um, excitability levels and the lower excitability levels in terms of the onset frequency 
Okay, so that's interesting. Basically, it's, it's telling us that this surround excitability um, seems to play a crucial role in determining what the siege onset pattern is. And to actually put a cherry on the cake, basically, you can actually analyze the model and look at um, dynamically, essentially, what the model um, is doing. And what you find is that in this highlighted red region here, you'll find that the model is bistable, whereas in this um, white region, it's monostable. So what do I mean by that? Um, bistable in this dynamical systems concept basically means that the surrounding, this healthy surrounding that we, um, pre or that we deemed healthy, actually has a coexisting seizure state already, and it only needs some provocation to move into this um, coexisting seizure state. Whereas in the uh, monostable state, there is actually only the normal state, and you have to um, work really hard to really create that second seizure state. So you have to provoke it very hard to actually make it, uh, essentially create the seizure state um, from the input, whereas here it is already pre-existing. Um, so that's something, so that kind of from a modeling perspective makes sense, basically meaning that if your surround is already ready to take up the seizure activity because it, it's, it's basically just sitting there and you only need the provocation, um, it makes sense that this, um, that this onset patterns are very high amplitude because they rapidly can generalize over this whole sheet. And uh, whereas in this case, you kind of slowly have to build up and invade the surrounding and then hence that's generating this low amplitude um, fast activity. Okay, so that's all nice from a modeling perspective, you know, we're happy as modelers, um, but it actually gives a very, um, it gives a model prediction as well, which, is in, which can be put back into the clinical context. And that is that it actually makes a prediction on surgical outcome. So what do I mean by surgical outcome? In these, um, in these seizure patients, in these focal seizure patients, what, what happens with them is that um, if medications fail, uh, or in particular cases where, where clinicians are fairly sure where the seizures are coming from, they're actually proposing to remove the piece of tissue that's generating the seizure activity. And so we're essentially um, doing epilepsy surgery. The surgery success rates these days is, um, depending on what paper you read, ranges between 50 and 70 percent. And so there is, a, in, a, in some patients, the surgery is not working so well, in others it's working better. And in our model, actually, or from our model, we can actually make a prediction regarding what onset pattern would predict a better surgical outcome. So in the low onset amplitude, uh, so low amplitude onset pattern, um, we would essentially so we would essentially say that because the seizure kind of starts from these little micro seizure activity, but it needs a long time to um, recruit the surrounding tissue um, to become this full seizure activity, we predict that if you were, we if we were to remove a piece of the tissue, then maybe we can cut out this. Um, Essentially, in this simulation, it was actually this big cluster here that, uh, in the first place, um, started the invasion into the surrounding tissue and hence uh, caused this full recruitment. If we remove that cluster of micro seizure activity, we can actually stop the seizure onset in a way. And although there are still other seizure clusters around, they don't recruit anymore because they are not in the because they're not um, either not spatially uh, close enough to recruit uh, or to recruit the tissue between them, or they're just not um, enough of them. So essentially, the prediction here would be that uh, if you see a lot low amplitude onset, you would say that they probably will have a better chance of success because their surrounding tissue, the healthy tissue, is actually healthy because there's no coexisting seizure state. But in the high amplitude uh, onset pattern, because uh, from the model, you know, we, we predict that it's actually the surrounding tissue that is already probably impaired and has got a higher excitability level and probably a coexisting seizure state already. We would say that the surgery success is probably not so good because after you remove um, a piece of tissue in the, in the high amplitude setting, the, although this healthy surround um, Although the surround um, is uh, basically the surround can still be provoked to have a seizure from other um, seizure micro seizure cause, and that's essentially illustrated here. Basically, that um, even after the surgery, although the uh, seizure starts slightly later compared to this original simulation, you can still see that a small uh, provocation essentially starts off a full seizure recruitment again. <coughs> 
Um, this prediction is, um, it comes from the model, but we can go back to the literature and actually see if there is some evidence for it. And although the evidence is not 100% clear cut because the, I think it's a, a problem with actually ident identifying what patterns, uh, what people actually associate with actual what morphology. Um, despite that, there is, I think, some good hints that that's actually the case. So um, I've highlighted four papers here, and essentially all of them say, um, so this uh, L low voltage fast activity and rhythmic sinusoidal um, waves were associated with a favorable outcome more often than the other three patterns. The other three patterns were in this case high amplitude onset patterns. Um, this paper here, equally fast focal activity at onset was associated with a favorable post-surgical outcome. Um, here they distinguished it by frequencies, but also that the higher frequencies, so higher than 8 hertz, indicated better surgical outcome. Here this is a slightly less uh, clear cut, um, where it says basically that the low voltage fast activity, but also high amplitude beta spikes, uh, predict a better surgical outcome than the other types. Um, so we can see that there are, there are definitely indications uh, going in the direction that, this, um, that the onset pattern is actually a predictor for the surgical outcome, uh, further consolidating the idea that com coming from the modeling that this, um, that's essentially the surround excitability will play a crucial role in determining your surgical success. There's actually one piece of direct evidence as well for what we're proposing in the model. And that is um, from Inatsu et al. And they essentially tested the excitability level um, in different onset patterns. Uh, what they show is, um, so in this is the um, low voltage fast. So um, the, the one that where we predict a better surgical outcome and where we predict the surround is actually less excitable. Um, they provoked or they stimulated um, the, the cortex of these patients. And here you see essentially the stimulation response. Um, the one to focus on is the solid line. So that's the uh, stimulation response uh, in this case, in the low voltage fast. And they repeated that for the high amplitude um, spiking pattern as well in this patient. And um, the response is this one. And essentially they argue that the overall response, um, or if you were to put an integral over this response, is higher than this. And the amplitude in general are also higher. So that's what they say in the in the results, basically, with a repetitive spiking group, amplitudes of the um, stimulation response is higher than in the paroxysmal fast group. Um, so basically saying that uh, if you were to test the excitability levels, they find that this um, high amplitude case gave higher excitability levels than this, which is exactly what the model is um, saying with the surround excitability as well. OK, just to conclude this, um, the different onset patterns uh, or um, different onset patterns can be identified in focal seizures and categorized. Uh, and our model suggests that the um, onset pattern might be associated with fundamentally different settings of the surround excitability. Uh, and I just want to emph emphasize here, actually, it's not the way that um, these micro seizures clusters are organized or how the seizure starts by itself, but it's actually what we think is the surrounding healthy tissue that's determining one case against the other. And this notion that we're proposing is also supported by some evidence from the literature, either by direct stimulation experiment or in, the, in terms of the surgical outcomes in the two patterns. And uh, because I was told I have a bit more time, I thought I'd squeeze in an outlook. Um, so the outlook is, is essentially asking the question, so what now? If, if, if that was true, what we're predicting in the model, then we're essentially saying that um, you know, in some, in some patients uh, with the low amplitude fast activity, they will be fine because if we treat them with, um, with surgery, then they should, you know, if we really get the focus, then they should be okay, they should recover. But what about these patients that actually have the um, high amplitude um, oscillations? Because we're saying there that their surround excitability is increased, meaning that even what we think is the healthy tissue might be impaired. So there are essentially two things that I would like to propose in that context. And um, one of them is to actually test and track these excitability level changes um, in the surrounding tissue or in general in the, in the cortex. And I've done some simulations in this case um, where I've changed the 
uh, again, this parameter here that essentially determines the surround uh, excitability, and I've simulated the corresponding uh, EEG for that, and you can see that essentially, despite these changes in excitability levels, there's not much change in the actual underlying EEG. Um, which is, uh, is exactly the scenario that we actually have with seizure patients. You know, when we just look at the background EEG, we don't actually know what the excitability levels are that underlies, you know, what state they what stays they're in. Um, but with repetitive stimulation, we might be able to get at that. It's this um, same idea that's, uh, that I've shown you before in the clinical context, where you essentially stimulate the cortex and measure the amplitude of the response, and that should hopefully tell you something about how provocable or excitable this cortex is. And if you do that and measure the uh, stimulation responses, you can actually see that it gives you, in the simulation, um, a profile like this. And you can actually correlate these two. So essentially, you can plot the um, excitability level here, and you can plot the average response amplitude here. And you see a fairly tight correlation between the two. So it's just in a model, uh, demonstrating, demonstrating the proof of principle that we can possibly actually get at these excitability levels. And very nicely, actually, recently, uh, Christia Meiser published a paper in PNAS um, showing exactly that point, and that you might even be able to track these excitability levels passively without the stimulation. So that's, I think, one way forward, um, because if we can actually track these excitability levels, there might actually be a way to control them. And that's uh, essentially um, the next point that I'm trying to show in this outlook what we can do in terms of what we can do. Um, the, so if, imagine that you can track excitability levels and essentially almost predict uh, when patients are more likely to have seizures. You can imagine a closed loop control device um, that interacts with the, either the excitability levels themselves or with the seizures. And I've just done a simulation of the principle, essentially, um, that uh, I envisage. So here um, I'll show basically some background activity and then about halfway through this video, um, there will be a seizure provoked on this uh, cortical sheet like that, and the seizures would spread and recruit the entire sheet. So that would be how the um, seizure would uh, be happening without any intervention. But if we could imagine that we actually could track this rise in excitability level leading up to this seizure and interact, uh, you know, and know when to interact with that, um, you'll see this in the second video, this is with closed loop control essentially. And what you'll see is actually you'll not see very much because it's controlled almost immediately by this closed loop control device. Oops. I don't know if um, I'll just show that again. It's about halfway through, you see this activity popping up but immediately being controlled by the, um, by, it's, it's essentially a three by three um, uh, micro stimulation device. And then the seizure is controlled and you can actually move on and you know, basically the patient wouldn't have any symptoms or hopefully wouldn't have any symptoms in this case. Um, so this is essentially the outlook I wanted to show that um, with these um, tracking and intervention of with this excitability levels, uh, we can maybe actually get a handle also on the second group of patients who um, have these high amplitude kinds of um, onset pattern. Okay, that brings me really to my end. Um, so I acknowledge my... Uh, collaborators in Newcastle as well as um, at Columbia, UCL and King's College. And as a final slide, I just want to draw some attention to a conference that we're organizing in Newcastle on computational neurology, and I think that's very relevant for this audience. Um, the abstract submission has opened, and uh, it will, the conference itself will run 20th and 21st of February next year. And yeah, we will welcome you all to Newcastle. Please register, well, please submit an abstract and then register. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. I have a question. In my opinion, uh, the model, uh, the WC model can permit you see these two states because the bifurcation of this model permit yes. have the oscillation of fixed point. Yes. And the Mm, by changing the pyramid, you can observe the state, the dynamic state of the, the network can jump from the uh, fixed point driven by a uh, noise, so you can see this uh, so-called uh, small amplitude, to the oscillation state, this uh, low frequency. So my question is, however, you, as, you, as we know, the CISA is uh, 
periodic attack disease. So that means after a period of time, it can go back to normal yes. by itself. Yeah. So how can you explain it? Since the pyramid already jumped from the fixed point to oscillation, how do we jump back? It right. seems a back and forth the pyramid in your model. So yeah. how can you explain that? Yeah, good question. Um, it's actually a, it's a slightly different field of research that um, I'm, I've not touched on here at all because I was more, more focusing on the clinical aspects. Um, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, essentially, if you look at it from a dynamical systems perspective, how can you conceptualize it? And you're very right. Um, one group of people say it's a bifurcation through, um, you know, whatever it is, hot, hot for homoclinic. And you essentially go through this background state, which is a fixed point to a oscillatory state um, limit cycle. And then the parameter driving that is some sort of brain state change that can you know, drive you into a seizure. And then they say, okay, the seizure would then terminate through this parameter changing back again. And that's a reasonable proposal, I think. Um, but I think so far nobody has been able to actually show what this parameter is, how we can control it, etc. It might be this excitability parameter, it might be something completely independent. Um, but there are alternative uh, proposals out there actually as well. Um, there are, uh, okay, one very prominent one of, of course is that from Lopez da Silva where they say actually it's not a bifurcation, it's a bistability. Essentially these two states coexist as exac exactly what I was showing in that model um, as, as one of the mechanisms to distinguish the high and low amplitude onsets. So in the bistability, so that's bistability in a spatial temporal context. What Lopez de Silva meant was simply that this, through this simple coexistence and through noise on the system, you can actually just get, um, well, random jumps to the oscillatory state and random jumps back. So you don't actually need a parameter change. All you need is a noise that drives that and the onset and offset would be perfectly determined by the, um, basically by this coexistence and how far the, they are in phase space. That explanation also has it got its problems when you test it in a clinical context. And there are other proposals out there, such as excitability and it being actually a, um, uh, a turbulence-esque um, attractor. But I think all of these uh, concepts can explain some proportions and some phenomena, but I think it's a, as a general question, it's not an easy one to answer. I don't think the definite answer is out there yet. When surgeons take the tissue out, do you then test it in the lab to see if you can detect any signs of the, uh, the sorts of mechanisms you're talking about? So, sorry, say that again. When the surgeons, if the surgeons actually uh, take tissue out to try ah, yeah. and cure it, can you then test that yeah. tissue to yeah. see if it's for direct evidence of your, of your mechanisms? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, there are, so in Newcastle, actually, we have the lab facilities to take out the, um, so to, to take the samples out and test them in various ways, electrophysiologically as well as um, by other chemical means. Um, the, the, the test of performing it of um, high amplitude versus low amplitude onset has not been performed, to my knowledge, ever yet in real life. Um, it's, it's probably worth doing. Um, but the other thing or the other problem that comes with it is as soon as you actually take these tissues out of their embedded environments, you might be actually destroying some of these excitability. Um, so if it's locally embedded in the tissue, yes, but it's if these excitability levels are actually driven by either the network or some inputs from the network, then it might be more difficult to track. So in a way, it's, it's, there's, it's not an easy um, experiment to directly address what I'm proposing in the model. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> Um, so how long time does these seizures take in, in the clinic? Or how do they stop and how, how do you think, is, are they jumping back then to the original stable state or what is happening? Okay, um, from a, so first the clinical side, um, the seizures usually last seconds to minutes. Um, there are some, there are some unfortunate patients which have something called status epilepticus where the seizure is thought to last for hours, um, although I don't think they are true 
I don't think it's the same seizure state as you see in the patients where it only lasts for seconds. But So that's on the question of duration. But that also makes the picture that we are trying to model actually slightly complicated. You know, What is it that we're trying to capture? Uh, in on Because the time scale of these seizures can actually range from <laughs> seconds to hours. So it's not quite clear. So in the from a modeling perspective, how the seizure stops, I would say I would give the same answer as actually previously. I don't think there is a definite answer out there as to what the mechanism is. A lot of mechanisms have been proposed. Either it's a parameter change back or it's this by stability where you, through noise, can go back to the seizure state. Um, there are ways actually to test for these different scenarios, more or less. Um, and I think depending on the seizure and depending on the patient, it might be entirely different mechanisms as well. So. Yeah, unfortunately, it's a very hand wavy answer, but I think the, I think this actually emphasizes something from the talk before that actually precision medicine here is 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 required. We can't actually just say, oh yeah, seizures in general start with this and end with this. It's actually a family of diseases, and it's actually, I think, quite a heterogeneous group, and that's why we're observing these different surgical outcomes as well. You know, we can't just treat everybody with this. Yeah, my opinion, but yes. Okay. Yeah. Can I Sorry. Another question up here. Hi. Thanks. <laughs> uh, very nice work. Thank you very much. Uh, quick questions about the uh, the model. Uh, first, do you have any delay in these connections or in the instantaneous? And then second question, um, as if you do the rapid recruitment, do you require prior, um, uh, basically, I think it was all for whatever you had, uh, background activity, or could you actually do this rapid recruitment from basically zero? Uh, is there is there a requirement of prior isolations or not? There's quite often a quite different recruitment in, in, in such models. Okay. The uh, just to clarify, actually, I think that I didn't explain that uh, very well. The ex the the background uh, state isn't actually in the dynamical systems um, sense is actually a fixed point with noise. That's why it looks slightly oscillatory. Uh, it's, it's around yeah. So it looks slightly oscillatory but irregular, uh, but it's actually just a noise driven uh, node in that case. The, um, and to answer your question about the delays, uh, the, what the simulations I've shown you were actually without delays. I've repeated the experiments with delays. It doesn't actually change this uh, bifurcation points for the bi-stability and the other points at all. And the uh, results are essentially qualitatively the same. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So.